like I'd had songs come out again before, but there had been a couple, probably like a year. I don't even remember how long that um, that nothing was coming out. I was like more so like even in the pop space, you know what I mean? That I wanted not like as much in like the R&B alternatives. Good, how are you? I'm doing well. I appreciate you doing this. Thank you so much. Of course. I'm so sorry this took so long to make happen. <laughs> oh, no. No need to apologize. It's totally, totally fine. I appreciate you doing it. Um, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, uh, my name is Adam, by the way. And uh, this podcast is about you and your journey in music. And oh. I love what you're doing as far as uh, the Green Room podcast thing that you got going as well. Are you still doing that? Yeah, 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 yeah. I thought I am. so. It's, um, it's, uh, you know, it's just something that's always been very important to me just because, you know, obviously like mental health is such a big aspect in, in so many people's lives. Obviously, you know, going through a pandemic, um, was something that really inspired me to start it. And I think that, you know, obviously it was a crazy time for everybody, but I think in general, I think as a creative person, um, you know, it's, it's, it can be heightened sometimes to deal with that type of thing. And I think sure. to, be able to have, you know, I'm always of the, the mindset that if you have somebody that's a, a good role model too, and just, you know, people that are going through it every day that, you know, their favorite artist or their favorite person that they look up to. And if they know they have a similar issue, it's, it's, it may be easier for them to get through. Completely. I totally agree with you. Um, do, sorry, real quick. I don't want to interrupt you, uh, but we use the video. Is that cool? Yeah, that's cool. I just wanted to make sure that I have the right. Do you mind? Okay. I just want we... to get you a little bit better lighting. Yeah, hold on a second. Where um so how how do yeah, how do you guys usually do the where does this usually go live? Um I we put it up on like we we use Spreaker to to go to all the, you know, iHeart, Stitcher, all that stuff. Um Apple Music, Google Podcasts, and we put it up on Instagram. YouTube, uh, Facebook, you know, and all that as well. Okay, cool. Let's see if this is, is this better kind of, or no, it's still, you're still a bit dark, but, uh, oh, now I can see you when you come closer. <laughs> but, How's that? That's better. Yeah. Now I can see you. Okay. I just, you were kind of a silhouette. <laughs> okay, cool. cool. Okay. No, perfect. Awesome. Okay. Sweet. Yeah. And yeah, we use the video and usually we're doing them in person up until obviously uh, the pandemic and uh, it was, it went this way, but it works out too. Cause now you can access way more people. And uh, we started doing them in person again recently, but we moved to Nashville. I used to be in San Diego. So it's different. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, zoom is cool. Cause like you can obviously make shit happen. Um, again, like you said, like, kind of anywhere you want to depending on you know obviously, obviously the time zones but it makes it a little easier because like before you know the pandemic people would just have to wait to travel right so right. that's it no for sure and especially i'm sure for you and songwriting and producing like being able to connect with somebody across the world like this instead of being like okay i'll be there in you know a week once i get on the plane and fly there and blah, blah, blah. It, i'm sure it makes it so much easier to just hop on the computer exactly exactly that's so great and it's it's wild that um, something as tragic as the pandemic created such a different, you know, environment for people to, to be able to connect. I know it's so crazy, right? I mean, you yeah. have to look again, you have to look at the positive from it. And that's sort of how I looked at, again, like you said, with the, the green room talks is that obviously it's such a terrible time and it's, um, you know, but I think you have to sort of, you know, take the 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 light in the out of the dark kind of thing and i think that's what people really need right now is to feel mm -hmm. positive you know and that's especially coming out of that phase so i think just to like you know and that's and that's what we're sort of here for especially as again creative people sure especially i i love that you have you know notable people on your show also i mean not that you aren't as well like you talking <laughs> personally about it and then talking to other people that are also you know, famous about it. Like, yeah, I was watching your one with like Jojo and, and, uh, I, uh, Taylor Upsall is a, is a friend of mine. So I saw that she was on your podcast too. So I watched that one as well. I just think it's cool to, to hear perspectives in that, in that space from, you know, other people that, like you said earlier, that a lot of people look up to. I know. I love Upsall, by the way. She's amazing. She's so cool. Um, I met her through this podcast, actually the first time 
she was opening up for uh, Max Frost or something on a tour. She, okay. I don't even know if she had a record or anything out yet. It was before she she really you know took off to what she's doing now. And then the next time she came back through San Diego, she was headlining. And then you know now she's she's doing so well. But she's such a great person. Oh, she's the best. I love her. Yeah, she's incredible. So that's so cool. Yeah. So I saw that you had her on. Uh, and then, like I said, I watched the JoJo one and a few others. So I love what you're doing. And then that studio that you guys have is so cool. Do you say you're like on Hollywood or Sunset or something? Uh, which studio? Or the one, I think it was, it's like green behind you. And you were like at a table, you had JoJo there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the Dash Studio radio, uh, Dash Studio. Oh, um, okay. It's sort of like TRL. It's really cool. It's like outside sort of has like the window that sort of is, sits on the sidewalk and people can just walk by and watch. And um, so the guy, um, his name is my wand that um, is, is one of the, I mean, he's one of the, I guess, DJs, or I don't know exactly what his title is there, but he really gravitated. He interviewed me early on in COVID and gravitated to the podcast. So he wanted to be a part of it. And I just love that idea. So he's been a part of it for the probably the past year. That's cool. That's really cool. I, a friend of mine, I, I come from radio and I love that. I saw that you uh, like, I, we'll talk about it if you don't mind, but like uh, yeah. you had uh, like an internship or something in high school, you were at a radio station or is that what I read? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, yeah. that's, oh, I'm obviously, oh, I mean, I don't know if you know, but I'm from Calgary. From and, Calgary, right. From what I read. <laughs> and, and but that's always burned me in the past. I, I, I it said that Eric uh, Wilson from Sublime was from Alaska. And I asked him about that. He's like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm like, you might want to get your Wikipedia page fixed, bro. <laughs> well, you know, what's funny is sometimes people clown you, obviously, on Wikipedia and put where you're like weird places that you're from, which is right. kind of cool. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so I mean, but um, what was I going to say? So yeah, being from Calgary, they, there, you know, there wasn't as many places that, you know, could help you get on or do things that, you know, obviously would um, help propel your career. And for me at the time, it was like, you know, it was trying to like open up for people or just that musicians that would come to town or whatever. And so like being, um, when I, when I graduated high school, the first thing I thought was like, oh, okay, well the next best thing is to like be in like broadcast, you know, journalism broadcast. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I went to school for six months for that. And, uh, at that, in that time, I just was like working at radio stations and sort of doing the overnight shift and like, oh, sure. Going, and then I decided uh, six months in, like my professor was like, oh, this is not, you need to be doing music. Like, um, we totally support that. You should just go pursue it. So I moved to Vancouver and they let me do two years. I didn't ever finish it, but two more years online for journalism. Oh, wow. At the same time, when I moved to Vancouver and started, you know, um, you know, just recording and stuff like that, I, at the same time, I was um, interning at Global. In oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's so cool. Yeah, I, I did. Ra I've come from radio. I did that for like 17 years. And a guy I used to work with because Dash is start was started by Snoop, wasn't it? I I don't know, but that uh, sounds. He, yeah, he has like a part in it. And a guy that I know and used to work with, his name is uh, Kevin James. He has a show on Dash or did have a show. On, I don't know if he still does, but he uh, he has got the really low voice, and he plays like a bunch of slow jam uh, R&B songs. He's, oh, I love name, that. Yeah, his name's Kevin Slow Jam and James. He's he was like on the early Snoop Dogg records and stuff. But uh, I I used to work with him, and he <laughs> he had a show on Dash. That's the only reason, uh, that's how I heard of it. And then I saw that your show was on there too through. But I didn't realize that they had that cool studio and everything. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, no, they definitely do. It's like, and they have a bunch of stuff that's really cool inside. They have like, um, I don't even know how to explain it, but there's this room that's just like completely like interactive, and it's like amazing. I love it. So you that's if you. I mean, where are you based? You said you're in Nashville. I'm in Nashville now, but I was in San Diego. I I grew up in San Diego. Oh well, amazing. Well, next time you're you're here, I mean, we should try to do some sort of collaborative thing between maybe the oh, group. That'd be so fun. Bring it back or whatever. Yeah, no, that would be so much fun. I would love to do that. That would be yeah. great. I love Very that. Very cool. Awesome, awesome. Well, um, well, let's talk about you. So you were born in, in uh, you said in Calgary. Yeah. Well, no, born I was born. I was born in Edmonton, but then I oh, moved okay. to like five. Okay. So tell me about uh, growing. So you mainly grew up in Calgary then. You you moved there when you're five. five is that what you said? Sorry. I, it, it cut out for a second. I moved there when I was five. Yeah. Okay. Five. And you, uh, when did you get into music? Were you 
playing an instrument at five or or later? So my parents um, got me like a little piano, a little keyboard when I was, you know, about five probably four or five and for Christmas one year. And I just started teaching myself, teaching myself a bunch of songs and they were just like, Oh my God, like our kid is kind of talented. I don't know. It was one of those things. And then um, they, but they never really wanted to push me. They kind of just followed what I wanted to do. And, um, but I wanted to do it all. And to me, it was always something that took over my life. I had way more interest in doing music than I did playing with friends and stuff. So um so yeah I just sort of like went into le- like you know whether it be vocal or piano or any kind of lesson that I could in Calgary mm-hmm. I did um I was part of a performance group called youth, the youth singers of Calgary and then um you know I did like you know kind of random things here and there like perform stage show with like um one of the, the uh one of the um what is it called human characters of Sesame Street this guy named Bob McGrath um oh wow yeah and and uh and so I did things like that sort of just as I was growing up, just to sort of be as much immersed in the scene as I could. And then obviously, like I mentioned, like later I, I did the radio stuff and sort of did some TV stuff. Like funny enough, it was um, like sports broadcasting. So it was it was so <laughs> did what I had to do. Um, right. Yeah. You, any way in. Right. I mean, it's OK. Sure. Like I was doing news uh I wasn't on the air, but like I, the gig I could get into the door was like uh, an assistant producer for like a, a like a news station, uh, like a radio station that was, you know, all news based. And I was like, I have no interest in this, but hey, I'll, it's, a, it's a way in the door. Let's do it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> thing. And then and then when I um, when, when I moved to Vancouver, it was sort of like that was sort of the kickstart of like being, I guess, in the real business you know what I'm saying because mm-hmm, before sure. I've been doing it but in terms of like I think I had signed my first production deal when I was um probably when I was 19 I would think yeah wow so well prior to that prior to moving uh were you you obviously were writing songs and performing and, and, and performing your own songs like was there a validating moment before you moved or it sounded like you said your professor was like you know you're you need to be doing the songwriting thing you should you should move in and uh, pursue that yeah, I mean, he, he, well, more so like the, at the time I was really focusing more on my artist stuff, but he, mm-hmm. he like noticed, I mean, I, like, you know, obviously the rest of my life, like I said, I mean, I had been doing like musical theater, anything to do with like in Calgary, people knew that I did music in oh, sense. Okay. It wasn't like, you know, Calgary is a big city, but it's also kind of small. So a lot of people know each other and, and whatnot. So I think that for him, he was like, I really think that this is not where your heart is. I think you need to go pursue music. But at the same time, we recognize that you want to get this degree. And at the time it was kind of like, we want to, they were just the most supportive they could be. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they, how about you go, if you want to go and do this, we let you do whatever you need. That was, that was basically how it went down. So when you move, when you moved to Vancouver, were you um, like, playing out like how to what was the first move that you made when you got there was like okay now I'm in a different space like was the music scene just a bit better like what was the benefit of going there I I just don't know much about it well at the time um actually a concert promoter I had met through opening for this artist Sean Desmond um I had met him and then he introduced me to some producers in Vancouver and that's basically why I chose and Vancouver just seemed like it made the most sense at the time too just because it was closer than Toronto Mm -hmm. and and then so I went and I just kind of made relationships with these initial producers and then sort of just kind of went from there and I developed my own open mic and uh, and it was kind of funny because I did it at a restaurant called Earl's I don't know if you're familiar but it's a pretty big chain in Canada and um and so it became sort of like a pretty popular open mic and um so that was really cool too and I met a lot of people in that Vancouver music scene that obviously not obviously, but that went on to have, you know, some cool success too. So it's cool. Like Canada's, you know, I mean, like it's so big, but it's also small, you know, like a lot of people sort of like cling to each other and and sort of, I feel like there's a very family oriented thing in in the Canadian music scene, which I love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's incredible. And with, were you, did you get discovered? Like, was it the deal out of something that happened at the, at Earl's at this of Mike Knight? Like how did you, you said you had 19, you were able to sign a publishing deal. No, no, no. I signed a, a production deal. Oh, production deal. Sorry. Okay. So 
So the production deal happened um, just by sort of, um, you know, basically had had been recording a bunch of stuff and one of the producers that I was working with just loved it and was like, Can, I would love to just do an EP with you. So we did a, we did actually like a more of like a jazz EP. Um, it was crazy. It was like, it was just so, um, I don't even know how to describe it. It was kind of, I mean, I grew up listening to Billie Holiday. She's one of my favorite artists, but it's more, Remis- like reminiscent of that sort of era okay. and um, anyway so there was a song that sort of crossed like both singer songwriter and Billie Holiday one song with guitar on on the EP that I ended up writing in my car because I you know at the time I've told this story a bunch um, but um, basically I just I had no money and I didn't really want to tell my parents so they would tell me to come back home so a lot of times I would just sleep in my car by mm-hmm. the water because I was like, okay, I don't want to drive. Because I was living kind of far away to afford living there in Vancouver. So I was living like outside of Vancouver. Uh-huh. Um, so sometimes I would just sleep in my car. And one year close to Christmas, I was writing a song, one to go on the EP, but also for my parents for Christmas because I couldn't like afford a gift. And um, th- and I ended up putting it on MySpace, funny enough. And that's how I got really discovered. And that's, that's sort of how everything really happened. Um, the manager my my floor manager chris smith from toronto had found me on myspace and he reached out so i ended up flying to toronto and showcasing for him and then ended up signing to him and then he sent um my stuff that same song to la reed who ended up signing me to def jam so that's and then i ended up moving to toronto and then like three years later to new york so. wow okay <laughs> no no no. no that's amazing and and that's after you had signed the deal that's when you had the song i i saw that you had the uh you had a song on Grey's Anatomy, which I thought was cool because that that television show is whoever the music director is there, it like knows how to pick like hits. It's so interesting. Like the talent that you'll hear that comes like out of Grey's Anatomy. I don't know if you've heard that before. Oh, no, 100 percent. I mean, Grey's Anatomy was totally known for breaking artists back in the day. I mean, I know. Just- Isn't that crazy? So crazy. And like, um, so I thought that was a really cool moment. And yes, that was definitely my odd. Like when I was signed to Def Jam, that happened. So that was cool. Yeah, I mean, it's it's such a bizarre show to be breaking artists, but it, it's been like notable for that. It's it's to me, it's just so cool. No, I know it's amazing. It's so cool. I, I mean, that was definitely. I mean, it's. I'm trying to think of shows like that now that have that same show. Oh, like Euphoria. It was kind of like oh, similar. Oh right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great. That's a great example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's just so cool. And especially like a show like Grey's Anatomy, which is, you know, a medical show that has really <laughs> nothing to do at all with music. And then it's pulling these artists out of it. That's just so cool. But um, so you, you, had, you had your artist project for a while and then um, you end up kind of transitioning into more of a songwriter, correct? Yeah. So basically I, um, you know, it was weird because when I was signed, I was signed for like seven years and six and a half, something like that. And it was sort of the transitional stage of like when it was really going to like the like heavy into the streaming era obviously it was still like the streaming era but it wasn't like how it is now where it's like you know you just have to be constantly feeding your audience especially right. the tiktok tiktok era you know what i mean so like that's it's it's just it was weird like almost when i was signed it was like in that like sort of gray middle zone where it was kind of switching from like time to time because like radio at the time was still i mean radio was still obviously you know, important to an artist's career, but it's definitely not what it was. You know what I'm saying? In the sense that it's mm-hmm. not how it's not how artists are breaking now. I mean, the song breaks on TikTok and before and by the time it gets to radio today, um, the song's not like necessarily like a cultural, it doesn't have as much cultural no, relevance. It's dead. Yeah, no, for for sure. And I was seeing that when, even when I was in radio towards the end, I'm like, Oh, that only took, you know, eight months before it hit top 40, before it became like a quote unquote hit. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's like. Radio is almost like, it's it's funny. I mean, especially for a songwriter, it's like, it's so important for songwriters though, right? I mean, that's how they make songwriters. make money. Right. But at the same time, it's like, it, like, in t- I think that it's like, you know, it, it has a different type of reach, but it's just not, it's not like when the song is really bubbling, you know what I'm right. saying? No, I know it's yeah, because I was on alternative radio and our demographic was 18 to 34 year olds. And I'm like, if you quizzed anyone pretty much up to 30, they have no clue what the hell you're talking about. If you're talking about the radio, they're like, what? <laughs> you know, what do you well, who's listening to that? And 100 percent. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. Yeah, it's insane. And, and so that's why, like. 
um, for me, like when I, I only put out like one single and one EP, like the whole time I was signed, which is crazy. It's unheard of now. Like that would not mm -hmm. happen. Right. So um, when I left, it was sort of the idea that I just wanted to be creative and have the stuff that I was making come out in the world. So it was, um, you know, I, being that I'm from Canada or from Canada, I can't even say <laughs> from Canada. And um, I, uh, you know, was living in Toronto. I, you know, the, some of the people that I knew, like, um, you know, just in the Toronto scene, like the, the, the even like the OVO circle kind of thing, um, they reached out like Noah, um, 40, he reached out and asked if I wanted to help co-EP the Magic Jordan EP. And that was basically the first sort of songwriting, vocal production, executive pre like experience that I'd had outside of being an artist. Um, mm -hmm. so how it kind of all started, really. Mm -hmm. and, and from there, you were just working with different artists and, and, and helping them kind of songwrite or writing, yeah. or writing songs with people or for people. Yeah, like I really enjoyed that process. So I feel mm -hmm. like from there, um, you know, I really, I tried to get a publishing deal and I was like, I really love this process. I love writing for other artists. I feel like, you know, I could still be creative. It's weird. It's like, you can take your, all the things that make you great and all the things they make that make them great and sort of make a baby with it. <laughs> I love right, that. Yeah. You know? I love that process. And to me, I was like, okay, this is cool. I want to do this. So yeah, I just started writing with a bunch of people and, um, and sort of just catapulted from there. That's so cool. I, I'm curious just because um, I'm I'm not a songwriter. I love music. I tried to pl play. I can poorly play guitar and stuff, uh, but I love it so much that I wanted to surround myself. My way in was through the radio. I'm like, oh, I can talk about it. I, I can soak it up and talk about it. But like for somebody that's a songwriter, maybe they don't want to be an, an, ar an artist or they don't have that. They just like the songwriting thing is more like what you were saying, like you love doing that. Like, how would you even like for a publishing deal, I'm just curious for people listening would be like, do you write like an EP or would you write like a bunch of demos and you'd sing them yourself and then submit them to like a Warner chapel or somebody like that? Is that kind of how it works? Not really. Like, okay. I mean, yes, like it, it used to work like that back in the day, but it doesn't really work like that now at all. Oh, it's just okay. like a lot of success doing that. Like for me, um, yeah, like in the beginning, I think that if you're in super development phases, then I think, um there's so many ways to do it I think now as like a young writer to be able to lack like I have my own publishing venture for example right mm -hmm. so it's like a lot of sense for a young writer in my opinion because you attach yourself to another songwriter that has experience with relationships you could be submitting songs to them and they can help you sort of you know pull apart your songs uh. help you like craft a song to be able to know what song is going to work for a specific artist you know what I'm saying no, so I see so, so for me, that makes a lot of sense for young writer producers coming up to have the influence under like more experienced songwriter producers. And then you're still under the umbrella of like a major publisher that can help, you know, place the songs in, 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 you know, if it's like a sync world or if it's in on certain artists, but for the most part, like for me, example, for example, I'm always sort of working with a handful of artists at one time. And so for me, I can help shop the songs myself you know what i mean right 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 so somebody would want to find like a mentor uh like you like it's say you you i met you and i'm like oh my gosh i love you and I, I have these songs like do you mind checking them out and if you listen to them you're like oh yeah these actually this is really cool like we could we could work together and then you you have the you have the network to be like okay yeah like oh this would be great for so and so and then you could reach out under that person so to speak exactly exactly got you that's the thing that I was saying that I feel like, you know, and again, that's not, there's not just one way, but I think mm -hmm. to be able to have, you know, some sort of mentor is definitely a way to go today because I think, um, again, it's so relationship based and it's so, it's not just about the song now. It's like, obviously you can write a hit song, but you have to be able to know, like there, you know, you have to attach it to an artist that has the right platform. That's the right, you know, feeling for it like they, they can sell it the right way like there's so many aspects that isn't just like hey warner or hey sony hey Universal. right right because it, it, it gets lost in the in the you know pile of a million songs and that's <laughs> yeah 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 because if you just send a blind email like the chances of someone ever stumbling upon it are probably slim to none well no but i'm saying if you signed a publishing deal like off oh. your let's say you signed a publishing deal now 
and you and you like you're just the beginning songwriter and you have no zero cuts and you have your publisher that you send songs to that's fine and they can send songs to artists but what's most effective in my opinion is to have another creative person that you sort of work with a lot and trust and under and so they you you can sort of form that team yourself and understand who the best people are to get these songs to because sometimes even if your publisher is amazing and they're sending it to certain artists like it's not the same like um connection to the song like that it would be as if it was just coming from like the creative circle if that makes right. sense no 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 that totally makes a lot that makes a lot of sense and that you said you have a joint because you do have a joint venture right as far as like a publishing company uh, you help publish you you help people that are songwriters yes i do yeah yeah yeah. i have yeah, a that's called 27 music mm-hmm. that i have um you know like people like jimmy allen and and um <sighs> little mix signed to i'm trying to think like well like a bunch of people actually yeah. like couple of the writers, Rob from Aldi, a guy named Alex Bilowitz, that were also co-writers on Butter um, for BTS. Um, but yeah, I, I've had this company for like probably around four years now. Yeah, that's so cool. And it sounds like even going back to the the Earl, uh, you know, open mic nights, like you had you you found uh, an, a knack for like grabbing young talent and having them what, sing at the open mic night. Now you're kind of finding talent that can help publish, you know, hit songs. Exactly. <laughs> that's such a cool, that's so cool. Like with that, do you, um, do you find yourself like going out and, and discovering talent? Like how, how are you finding new artists and cool new people? I mean, really, it's just about being in the scene and sort of just like being able to like, I'm writing a lot with people and just sort of um, in the studios, just meeting people and being like, oh my God, I love you or you're amazing. Like really, it's just that. It's like very organic and natural. That's so cool. Uh, well, just to comment on, I mean, obviously you have a huge, huge success and with, with Butter is a massive song and then you even did Dynamite, right? You vocal, vocal produced Dynamite for BTS. Yeah. yeah and were those things that just kind of like, how, how do you, does it eventually get to a point where you, like, what was the first like big cut, would you say, that kind of opened the door to these other, other artists and other bigger opportunities? I mean, you know, it's interesting because I feel like there's been a lot of things like that along the way. Like, I think Jesse J was one that really helped me get to certain places at the time. And then there was like, um, you know, just trying to think like um, there's like a Drake song that I was a part of that really helped sort of open doors to certain um, artists. And then and then like over the pandemic, Super Lonely happened mm. that I wrote artist Benny that really just sort of that's that really helped open the door actually to even to BTS that's when they first reached out about me working with another band of theirs TXT and that sort of led me also to to vocal producing Dynamite so you know every sort of like every little piece counts you know sure sure that's yeah that's so amazing like to 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 see that that uh, like that must have been well, obviously validating in the sense like what was like like even before that you must have had a, like a validating moment or a, a moment when like after you had you know left the the artist project in the sense and, and started writing songs like would, was there like a first one that you were like okay or was there a point where you're like I, I, I don't know if this is going to work out and then you you got like something landed and you're like oh awesome like that'll keep me moving forward I think really that yeah like this Jesse J song called personal okay those songs I feel like I was one in that one of the like I'd had songs come out again before but there'd been a couple probably like a year I don't even remember how long that um that nothing was coming out like more so like even in the pop space you know what I mean that I wanted not like as much in like the R&B alternative space but like I wanted to have like a real pop song and I feel like when that happened that really like changed a lot and it was like the time it was like it was like a really big deal to get into other rooms Mm mm-hmm that's yeah um with that like are you still working with i mean aside from the artists that you work with directly under your publishing company are you working with with other artists like constantly like what like a a daily schedule are you mainly working with other songwriters within your your um publishing company or other artists bigger artists or uh, other people reaching out to you yeah just like sort of all of it you know i mean i just it, um, I'm working a lot with this artist um, named Jesse Murph, and she's amazing. Um, we just had a song actually go gold called "Always Been You." Um, she's a brand new artist. She's a, she, you should check her out if you don't know her already. She's an amazing voice. Um, just finished yeah. like the. What was? Sorry, I'm gonna type it in real quick. Uh, Jesse Murph. Oh, I know the, the name sounds familiar. Okay. And then, cool. 
did the Dixie D'Amelio record um, that just came out. Um, and oh yeah, that- you did. Yeah, I forgot that. I did read that you did the Dixie D'Amelio record. That's that's awesome. And that was really interesting because, you know, I think she really wanted to come into a phase in her life where she really wanted to make music that said something and really expressed how she felt. So that was a really interesting um, experience to have. And I just loved, you know, getting close to her. And it's always amazing to, you know, this is the first actual album I've been a part of. And I think um, to have that experience to spend every day with somebody and really understand their life story is just such a cool experience. So did you, did you work with her in the past or was this the first time you had worked with her? Well, I met her in like November. So we've been sort of working on it, you know, off and on since then. But it, it really sort of pressed the green light in February. So we had okay. like really months to really finish it, finish it, which is crazy. It's like not typical that you do a whole album in three months. Yeah. In, in those situations, do you I mean, you you must have to like spend a bunch of time with them and really get to understand them and their their personality and their life before you can even start writing. Or does she have an idea and then you just vibe from there or like like something like that? How would you even approach that? Yeah, I mean, it's like just all of the above, really. It's just okay. finding right um you know just like being able to find the the every day is like a different story and a different thing that she wanted to bring in and talk about and it was really that just learning her voice and understanding what she like kind of like what tempo of songs she wanted to do what kind of feeling of songs like all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. that's amazing and uh you're still just to you know kind of wrap up with you i appreciate your time and uh, are you you're still doing the green room pretty frequently is that like a (laughs) I'm trying to do it like once a month now, just because I feel like after, um, you know, after COVID and stuff like it's uh, in in person stuff, it's been a little bit like with the Dash Dash Studios and things. It's just organizing who feels comfortable with going to the studio or who wants to do it on Zoom. But like for the most part, we've been still keeping up like to once a month. It's It's been really cool. That's awesome. I mean, you have so many things going on. I'm surprised. Like, it's so cool to hear that you can continue doing that besides like writing a record for somebody, running a publishing company and then doing, you know, doing the podcast and all all that. It's uh, I love what you're doing. Thank you so much for doing this. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Last question for you. Um, I want to know if you have any advice. You kind of already answered this, but I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Um, I, you know, my best advice is to just hustle, you know, and, and I feel like not, not, ever really give up. I mean, it sounds kind of cliche to say, but I think for me, I think, um, especially in today's world, like you can just constantly be, be, be like active on social media, hitting people up. And for like, you know, again, cliche to say, but for like 99 people that don't answer one person will, you know, and for that one person, you might meet the next person. And I find that it's like that osmosis effect where it's just like you keep it's gonna grow you just have to let it kind of get there you know you can't and I think from my experience at least it's like you never know that one key person that's gonna lead you to a place that will change your life